having me. All right, have a seat. Sure. Uh, Hello everybody, welcome to MNB World Talk Show. Well, today we will talk with a beautiful lady who's a yoga and meditation instructor. Well, this beautiful lady sitting beside me is Miss Alicia Barclay Sutton, who is a Australian volunteer at Zurich Foundation. Well, people call you Bardi. Mm -hmm. Why? Yeah. Why not Alicia? <laughs> so that's an interesting story. So like whenever I go to the doctor, I always have to remember that my legal name is Alicia because mm. I actually forget because I've been called Barty <laughs> for so much of my life. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So when I was little, my dad used to hold me as a baby close to him like a little frog and he'd call me my little buddy. So buddy means like friend. Mm -hmm. So when I went to school, I told everyone that my name was Barty. And then my parents were like, yep, cool, you can keep it. And so then throughout my life, I've gone through body, body, body. Mm -hmm. And then um, actually you, to change your name legally, it takes mm -hmm. a lot of effort. So in Australia, your passport lasts for 10 years. So my passport expires at the end of this year. So I will be legally changing my name to legally avoid- Legally changing yes, your name? Yes, yeah, Becoming yeah. Becoming body officially. Yeah, because that, that's my identity. That's who I am. It's uh -huh. what I've always been known as. Um, but yeah, interesting origin story of where the name wow. came from. If <laughs> someone call you like Alicia from far, it would take a while. It would yes. take a while. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I've got to remember. I'm like, that's your name. That's your name. You know, it's like I feel like a fraud when I'm going through like you know airports and stuff. <laughs> I'm like, remember, that's your name. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, you had a psychology and anthropology mm -hmm. degree yes. from University of Melbourne. I do. Right. Can you tell me more about your life before Mongolia? How was it mm. and what did you do yeah, before definitely. coming here? Um, so I, as you mentioned, studied psychology and anthropology, mm -hmm. which are things that I think go really well together um, and really suit aspects of my personality. Mm -hmm. I've always been interested in human behavior. Mm -hmm. And from a very young age, I was always known as like the charity girl. <laughs> um, so for me, I've always been passionate about social justice. So that took many forms, starting mm -hmm. as like doing fundraisers in high mm -hmm. school. So we had challenges like the 40 hour famine run through World Vision, mm -hmm. where you don't eat for 40 hours to help raise funds for people living in poverty around the world. Mm -hmm. And then that progressed to volunteering and then that progressed to actually traveling abroad mm -hmm. to Ghana in West Africa, where I was an English teacher for mm -hmm. three months living in a rural community. Wow, yeah. in Africa. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So West Africa was there. Um, very, very interesting time living there as an 18 year old, um, you know, fresh out of high school. Mm -hmm. I just always had a passion to travel the world. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I was really fortunate to be able to go on another three month trip, continuing on to see all from East Africa all the way down to South Africa. And that finished in a skydiving trip in Namibia, wow. which was awesome. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I think that really sparked my love of travel. Uh -huh. And I think that's where anthropology for me came into it mm -hmm. because I always wanted to help people and I thought psychology was the way to do that. And that, that's why I pursued that course mm -hmm. because I realized that people had you know, broken minds. But when I started traveling, I actually saw that there were parts of our world that were broken and weren't working in the way that I wanted it to. And for me, anthropology is a way of connecting into different cultures and communities and seeing the brokenness as an opportunity for transformation. And so I was really lucky to find that through that trip. So then when I came back and studied, I decided to pursue both those, those things together. And wow. yeah, it's led me on my career. <laughs> Very angelic lifestyle. Yeah, I like <laughs> it. I must say. <laughs> As a tradition, we uh, show who you are on mm -hmm. papers, yeah, CV great. and photos. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's take a look at that. Wonderful. Well, interesting stuff. So you're working as a, a volunteer, mm -hmm. Australian volunteer in Zurich Foundation. What is the most challenging aspect 
working with Mongolians. Yeah, that's correct. In so, a work environment. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So I'm here on the Australian Volunteers Program. Uh, so I'm actually the third volunteer at my organisation at Zorig. So yeah. I think that means that they've kind of paved the way with some of the challenges. Because mm -hmm. something that, you know, as I mentioned, cross-cultural communication is can be a challenge, but it's also an amazing opportunity to learn a lot. Mm -hmm. So I think having worked with international people before, that's made my, you know, situation a little bit easier working there. Um, but I guess the biggest challenge would be that they're so passionate and they're so focused on everything that they want to achieve. Sometimes we do too much. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so we try to do too much. Um, and so in Australia, we're very focused uh, from a time perspective on everything being organized and ordered. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in Australia, I use a Google Calendar and I make my week plan. In Mongolia, it changes. It every changes, week, it just, it every day, every week, every yeah. day. Yes. One day I'll show up and they're like, we've got a grant. It's due in two days. Let's do it. <laughs> and the thing is, you always get it done uh -huh. um, and people are always happy with the work, uh -huh. but it's a very different working style. So mm. something I've noticed throughout all my travels is everyone has a different sense of time, right? So in Mongolia, time just seems to be flexible. It mm. always has enough time for whatever it is you want to do. <laughs> you know, um, I know when I was traveling up to Husku Lake earlier, um, as we were driving back down, we kept asking, oh, what time do you think we'll arrive? And in Mongolia, I learned there's a superstition that you're not meant to estimate your arrival yes, time. Yes, yes. But nobody told us that. So we kept uh -huh. asking and they were like, <laughs> it'll be this many kilometers. Uh -huh. But Mongolian roads, kilometers mean nothing uh -huh. to me as uh -huh. an Australian. Uh -huh. So then we'd use Google Maps and we'd try to work out, okay, maybe we'll arrive at this time. Uh -huh. Then we'd use a different app and go, maybe we'll arrive at this time. And there was a German girl <laughs> and she just kept asking. And then eventually we said, we'll arrive when we arrive. <laughs> yes, I think they said. <laughs> yeah, it's like, we'll arrive when we yes. arrive. They got so annoyed at this poor German girl um, <laughs> because she just kept, like, every day she'd be like, uh -huh. how long will this take? And, you know, having travelled through so many different countries that are mainly in the developing part of the world, for me, I'm used to, you know, things just take as long as they take and you have to be flexible. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess travelling, that's fine. You can just be like, whatever, I'm mm -hmm. on holidays. Mm -hmm. When you're working and it's like, Stuff's got to get done. The time sense is yes, like that. It's yeah, very you, <laughs> you want things to be a bit more organised. So I've had to adapt um, mm -hmm. from that perspective. And the thing is, the work always gets done and it is often to just the same mm -hmm. standard. Mm -hmm. It's just done in a different manner. <laughs> yeah, what's the bad side of it? Um, I think it, you can get quite stressed. So mm -hmm. I think something I've noticed is because a lot of my colleagues and the people that I'm surrounded by work so hard. I know some of the other Australian volunteers notice that as well. <laughs> We're all trying to keep up okay. and work as hard as our colleagues. Uh -huh. um, I think something that is happening around the world because of technology, we can work 24 seven and that doesn't mean it's a good thing. So we shouldn't be active all the time. We shouldn't always be responsive. Uh, something I've noticed about the Mongolian work culture is emails aren't as popular as Facebook or calling. But mm. Facebook and calling can be more invasive because you can not have your email notifications on your phone. Mm -hmm. When your phone rings, you answer it and then immediately you're always available. And I think we need to make sure we allocate time to look after ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then that's when we work and function best, mm -hmm. when we're making sure we have a balanced life. So I think that's something that, you know, mm -hmm. as an Australian, mm -hmm. it's not like we've got it sorted. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that work-life balance is something that, you know, from a cultural perspective, mm -hmm. I, I hope maybe local people can start to look at that yeah. and analyze, you know, that it's okay to want to look after yourself. You don't have yeah. to work all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I definitely agree. Mm. I definitely <laughs> You're agree. You're a hard worker, I think. <laughs> I do. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, I work just like that. Yeah, exactly. And we work as a, yeah. as a TV. We don't have, have uh, that kind of time exactly. sense yeah. when it comes planning and working, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you don't have office hours. So. Mm. Uh, well, you work with Mongolian youth mm -hmm. at Zodok Foundation yes, very closely. Yes. <laughs> youth projects, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. Zodok Foundation is focused on youth yes. very much. Mm -hmm. What kind of skills could Mongolian youth hone more mm -hmm. from your perspective, from just your experience? Yeah, definitely. Um, something I've observed specifically from some of the programs that we're running is it's actually a similar problem we're having in Australia is the gap between education and employment. So that's something that's a real mm -hmm. challenge as more and more people become educated because education is becoming easier and easier to access mm -hmm. and it's a human right, so it should be. Mm -hmm. That means that sometimes the education that's offered might not be as high quality as it should be. Mm -hmm. You have access to it, but it's not the quality you need, which means it's not giving you the skills you need to survive in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And so I think technologically speaking, we're transforming more towards a world that requires transferable skills. Whereas previously you would go and you would do a degree and then that might be your career for your whole life mm -hmm. for maybe our parents' generation, right? 
-hmm. For our generation, that's not what's happening at all. Yeah. You go, you do a degree, you learn some things, maybe you learn about topics, maybe you learn about you know, actual skills, but either way, the world is changing so fast, education can't keep up just from one degree. So making sure that you have those transferable skills mm -hmm. that may be able to get you that job you know, things like being able to write a resume, being able to go for an interview, being able to research, being able to have critical thinking, all those sorts of skills, I think, are really important for surviving in today's workplaces. Mm -hmm. But I think more than that, that emotional intelligence as well is something that is really helping people survive mm -hmm. in workplaces. But also, I think, you know, making sure, I guess, from an emotional intelligence perspective, I was really touched by one of the programs I worked with young people in the Young Scholars Program. So we take 30 young Mongolians and we take them away to Naramdor camp and okay. we support them with an intensive program to help them get into international universities. Uh -huh. So these are some of the brightest minds mm -hmm. and they're very intelligent. I was so excited to spend mm -hmm. a week with them. Mm -hmm. But something I also noticed was that they were so stressed by this pressure to be so successful and they carried this burden of their parents wanting them to be so successful. Mm -hmm. And I observed within them that yes, this was something that they wanted, but we're in this cusp of globalization where people are finding themselves as individuals in a collective society. So when I say that, I mean they're acknowledging that they have their own wants and needs, but they feel the pressures of meeting their parents' wants and needs as well. Mm -hmm. So I think in terms of Mongolian youth, it's really bridging that generational divide mm -hmm. so that they feel like they can be true to themselves and they can live a life that makes them happy and fulfilled mm -hmm. and be successful on their own terms. Exactly be successful on their own terms. Exactly, yeah. That's what we need because nowadays I even notice that mm. the parents, they want the, the kids to become successful yes. and success, success. Yes. And what is success really? Exactly. Right? And it means something different to you yeah, and it means yeah. something different I mean, to me. And that's okay. It can be just living happy. Definitely. Right? Happy with a family. Yeah. That can be a success mm -hmm. to somebody. 100%. But Okay, yeah. it's got I mean, it. when I went to school, mm -hmm. it was told if you were smart, you became a doctor, you became a lawyer, you became this. Mm -hmm. Whereas now, as I mentioned, the world is changing so quickly. Yes. It's not just about specific careers that you can use to make a difference or you can use to be successful. I mean, you know, entrepreneur is like one of the big buzzwords of the day, mm -hmm. things like that. There's so many opportunities for people to find a life that is meaningful to them. Exactly, exactly. Well, uh, since you are coming from Zodiac Foundation mm -hmm. office, yes. <laughs> and uh, let's uh, show Certainly. what you do at Zodiac Foundation. Great, let's now. take a look. Yes, let's take a look. So here at the Zurich Foundation, I'm the only Australian. The rest of my colleagues are all Mongolian. Um, coming to Mongolia, I didn't know what to expect in terms of work culture, um, but I'm really proud to actually be working with pretty much an all-female team who are all incredible at what they do. They're very talented, they're very committed, and they're very passionate about the work that we do, advancing democracy and making sure young people get opportunities to hear that, have their voices heard and to get out there and be active citizens. So here we have our worm composting farm. So you can see here that there's lots of worms clumped together. That usually happens when they really like something. So things like eggshells we try to put in every week because that's really good nutrients for the soil and they like them. So everything has to be ground up as small as possible. We try to bury it. Now I usually move it around like this to aerate it. You can see there's an eggshell as well. Some of the other things we like to put in are from our coffee. So I've got some vegetables here, green leafy vegetables, a tea bag, as long as it doesn't have any staples in it, it's organic, that's fine. So we break that up and we bury it to make sure that there's no smell. Anything that the worms like, they'll clump up around. So you can see here, I've got another tea bag, so I just bury it and then we aerate it. And then as you can see here, all of this soil, this is already composted, so the worms have broken down the organic materials. And then every month, there we go, there's a few of them. They really like that, it's an apple core. And every month or so, they will breed and we'll have more worms. And then we'll have some fertilizer and you can put it on your plants. Well, you are feeding a worm. Yes. <laughs> that is very unusual in Mongolia. <laughs> yeah. I've never seen or heard anybody who 
feeds worm <laughs> why so i'm really passionate about zero waste lifestyle so that zero was, waste lifestyle yeah, okay you how, how is it connected okay <laughs> uh so um Something that I, you know, <laughs> have incorporated into my life is I want to live the way I want the world to be, right? So I want to live my values. And part of that is zero waste. So I want to leave the world as beautiful as I found it. And that means reducing my consumption. And so worms come into it because we have a composter at the office. So actually Mongolia, one of the largest proportions of landfill waste is organic matter. So a way mm -hmm. to reduce that going to landfill and reduce the impact is to put it in a worm farm. And then the worms can eat half their body weight every day of organic <laughs> waste, and then it becomes fertilizer. Okay. So it's a way of completely breaking down everything. Yeah. Oh, okay. So we introduced that into my office. So that's a, a little nice thing that gets left behind when uh -huh. I leave. Uh -huh. Well, you've traveled a lot mm -hmm. and Mongolia is 12th country, yes, that's I correct. believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you share s the most memorable travel experience with our audience? Mm, that's a great question. Um, not so including Mongolia. Yes, not including Mongolia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so yeah, I've traveled to 12, now 13 countries as well, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, so I, I decided, as I mentioned before, I went to Ghana in West Africa, and then I traveled all the way from East to South Africa. And that was mm -hmm. a very memorable experience, you know, traveling on a bus. And then after that, I have traveled to places all throughout the Asia Pacific region as well. Mm -hmm. um, but the most memorable experience, I think, has been some of my development work when you meet people in the field um, and you see you know how people are living their lives and how your work is making a difference uh -huh. really it just gets you in here mm -hmm. you know when you actually know that you've changed someone's life so when i was working in ghana i was only there for three months as a teacher um, but the work i was doing there i found a kid that didn't know his alphabet and he was about nine years old mm -hmm. and because of the poor quality of education system there no one had picked up that he didn't know the alphabet and he didn't know how to read mm -hmm. because he had learned how to survive. So he had learned when people were reading, he remembered what they were saying. Mm -hmm. He couldn't read though. So when they did practice tests, he was just repeating the words. So mm -hmm. being able to teach someone the alphabet, which is something that is so simple and basic to you or me, mm -hmm. meant the world to this kid because that was the start of changing his educational journey. Mm -hmm. So I think having an experience like that, it just always you know, really sticks with you and it makes Give you All of it worthwhile. In your work. Yeah, that it, that it's experience. making a difference. Mm -hmm. You gave this little push mm. for him to start his educational journey. Definitely. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay. Now, <laughs> <laughs> the most painful or challenging memories in your life. Yeah. Because we humans have <laughs> our pains and sorrows mm. and happiness mm. all the time, so that makes us humans, right? Yeah. Not robots. So can you share some story? Mm -hmm. Challenging times. Yeah, definitely. Um, so something I'm very happy to be open about in my life is that I've struggled with my mental health. So, you mm -hmm. know, all of us have, you know, lives and mm -hmm. stuff is always happening around you, mm -hmm. but how we handle it and our resilience is something mm -hmm. that obviously really makes a difference. Mm -hmm. And there's times where things will be really challenging and, you know, you won't have that resilience to, to feel as strong as you need to be to survive. So when mm -hmm. I was quite young, I was bullied. Um, mm -hmm. at about you know, nine years old mm -hmm. um, by another girl in my school. Mm -hmm. And when you're young, you just want people to like you. You know, mm -hmm. you just want to have friends, you want to be liked. And she actually turned everyone in the school playground against me for whatever reason. Um, mm -hmm. And I felt very alone and isolated. Mm -hmm. So then because of that, I worked really hard in my academics so that I could transfer to go to a different school. Okay. And because of that, I think that really set me on a journey of obviously wanting to work hard to achieve things that were mm -hmm. meaningful to me. Um, but it also instilled something in me that I felt like I wasn't good enough. And mm -hmm. so from, over, from, from that one experience, it's something I still struggle with today. And I think many people do is trying to feel good enough. And what's that standard where you're happy with who you are and you're not comparing yourself to other people. Mm -hmm. And so throughout my life, I've struggled with mental health challenges that have come up at various times mm -hmm. and made things like studying harder than it needs to be. So mm -hmm. I actually did my degree part time so mm -hmm. that I could balance working, studying and my mental health mm -hmm. and self care. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the end, I've still got to where I want to be. Mm -hmm. You know, I love my life. Mm -hmm but it doesn't mean that you don't still struggle. And there are times where you doubt yourself, you know, you feel like an imposter. Sometimes mm -hmm. you wonder, you know, mm -hmm. you do things and you think, is that me? Is that good enough? What will people think? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a lifelong journey to fall in love with yourself. Isn't it for everybody? Definitely. I mean, I yeah. do have those kind of problems too. Mm -hmm. And 
Who doesn't? Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think so often, especially because of social media, we're comparing our backstage to everybody's front stage. So I think that's made it harder for the next generation of young people mm -hmm. is that they make it easier to compare themselves to other people and they think that they're falling short mm -hmm. because nobody's really sharing their full self everywhere they go. So I try to be as transparent and vulnerable as I can be mm -hmm. because of me sharing my story makes somebody else realize within themselves that it's actually okay that they felt that way and that there's hope and light at the end, mm -hmm. then I think that is worthwhile. Mm -hmm. I think this is where the yoga comes in. Yes. In mm -hmm. your life. Definitely. <laughs> yes. Let's talk about uh, yoga. Mm -hmm. What is the philosophy behind? I mean, we all know, our audience mm -hmm. all know, mm -hmm. like, the different kind of shapes they yes, make with their body, etc. Yes. But what is a root philosophy of mm -hmm. yoga to you, mm -hmm. from your perspective? Mm -hmm. And what did it bring to your life? Definitely. Um, so I started ballet when I was really young and then that's when yoga kind of came into the picture at an older age as something that fits into my lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, and as you mentioned, many people see yoga as these fancy poses on Instagram, but that's not a yoga philosophy at all. That's just a pose. It's just a moment in time. Yoga is an inner journey that you go on to not only find yourself, but to find peace, I think, within yourself. And that's such a big thing to say, and it's such a cliche thing to say, <laughs> um, but yoga is a process of self-acceptance. So every day when you get on your mat and you do yoga, one day you might do that pose, and then the next day you might not do that pose. So it's being able to learn how to go with the ebbs and flows and fluctuations of life. And it also gives you that moment in time to just solely be. So being is so important in today's society when we're so busy. You know, I've said this again and again, but we're just so busy and we think being busy is a good thing, but actually slowing down gives us more time in our life when we take, you know, carve that time out of our day. It's like a daily routine. It's a ritual that you're committing. I'm worth it. I deserve that time for me every day to practice my yoga or for meditation, like mindfulness meditation is about being solely in the moment. So Anytime you can practice mindfulness meditation, what can I hear, what can I see, what can I touch, what can I smell? It's about absorbing all that the world has to offer rather than just like running through it and getting from one thing to the next thing to the next thing. Mm -hmm. So I think yoga has given me like peace and stillness and self-acceptance. And it's definitely given me a sense of um, happiness even when things are hard, you know. I started practicing ballet when I was three years old and I did that for about 15 years and then as I finished school ballet was no longer something that fit into my schedule and I moved on to practicing yoga so I've been doing yoga for about eight to ten years now and recently early this year I decided to become a trained yoga teacher so I went over to Dharamashala in India which is where the Dalai Lama is based and I practice at the city school of yoga there so to be qualified you have to do 200 hours of yoga teacher training and this is something that was an enormous wealth of knowledge for me to learn from the birthplace of yoga, which is India. For me, yoga is something that gives me presence to make it through my day. It's something that helps me cultivate being my most authentic self. And I think that's something that's quite hard to do in today's society because we're so busy doing things, we don't actually practice just being. So for me, yoga is something I love to share with other people around me because I notice how stressed my friends and family tend to be. And it's something that just carves out a little space of time in your day just for you to bring yourself back to your awareness. Mindfulness meditation is something I like to encompass in my classes. I always like to have a theme when I'm teaching friends, family or people I don't know in studios. And I've been really amazed by the yoga community here in Mongolia. It's clearly thriving. Let's talk about family. Yes. We haven't mentioned our family. You have a very interesting family. 
I do. Very interested to our audience. Talk about it. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh -huh. So I was born in Sydney, Australia to uh -huh. my mom and my dad. And then when I was quite young, about three years of age, they split up mm -hmm. and then my dad remarried. And I now have a half brother who's about 15 years old. Mm -hmm. So he's half Australian, half Egyptian. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I was nine years old, my mom sat me down and had a conversation with me to tell me that she was gay. And so for my whole adult life, that's mm -hmm. how I have known my mother mm -hmm. is with women. And in Australia, we you know, live in quite an inclusive society, mm -hmm. but even at that point, it was still quite a challenge because it meant that my family was different. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at one point I had my stepmom, my mom and my mom's partner. So I had three moms and one dad. So <laughs> three moms and one <laughs> yes, dad. Yes, yes. So <laughs> obviously quite unique. In Australia, we call that like a rainbow family. Rainbow family, yes. that's what you call it. Yeah, okay. we call it a rainbow mm -hmm. family. Mm -hmm. So from a very young age, like I knew my family was different. And it also meant that I had this strong desire to protect my mum from my friends who wouldn't maybe understand it. Mm -hmm. So I love my mum and I'm so proud of her and I'm proud to be an ally to the LGBT community. Mm -hmm. But as a young person, especially, you know, in primary school and high school, yeah. you just want to fit in. So mm -hmm. it's a challenge to understand. I want to be open about this in my life, but mm -hmm. I also don't want anything bad to happen or anyone to say anything bad or misunderstand. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I guess that was quite a challenge at a young age. And, you know, being older now, it's something that I don't have to worry about anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I can be, you know, out and proud about my family's experience. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is something that really impacted how important inclusion and diversity is to me in my life today. And I guess the work that I do, because I know what it's like not to fit in and not to be included. Mm -hmm. Well... <laughs> in Mongolia, yeah. you don't hear this story. No. No, <laughs> no it's I very mean, uncommon three here. Three mums and... Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. <laughs> well, uh, our time is ticking, uh, mm -hmm. so I want to ask my last question. Mm -hmm. It is about future. Mm -hmm. How do you see your future? What is your dream? Mm. Yeah. Give us some... <laughs> detailed image of your yeah. future? <laughs> so I think that's a great question. Um, I'm not someone that really plans very far ahead. I okay. mean, I would have never known a year ago that I would be sitting here in Mongolia doing the work that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned, you know, countries just keep